ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Welcome to ID the Future. I'm your host, Andrew McDermott. Today, I'm continuing my discussion with Dr. Eric Hedin about his recent articles at Evolution News on the intelligent design of sleep. Dr. Hedin is Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy at Ball State University in Indiana. He is author of the recent book, Cancelled Science, What Some Atheists Don't Want You to See. He speaks regularly at universities around the country and writes on the evidence for intelligent design at evolutionnews.org. Dr. Hedin, welcome back. Thank you very much, Andrew. Great to be here with you again. Looking forward to continuing our discussion about sleep. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic. In the first half of this conversation, we talked about the first of your two articles on sleep. We considered why we even sleep in the first place. We looked at why an evolutionary mindset is an obstacle to our scientific understanding of sleep. And we discussed the various complicated processes involved in falling asleep and waking up and how our sleep-wake cycles exhibit a type of complex engineering design pattern known as the push-pull principle. Well, today we're going to dive a little deeper into the science of sleep. We'll review some of the hypotheses that researchers offer for the function of sleep, and we'll discuss why sleep is so essential to humans and other living things. We'll also explain how sleep demonstrates at least two levels of intelligent design. Let's jump back in. First, researchers have posited several theories or ideas or hypotheses for the function of sleep, one of which focuses on sleep as a process of restoration. Tell us about the restorative theory. Well, again, we um, have ideas about the purpose of sleep. And I think that, uh, again, from my research, the word mystery surrounding sleep is is used by researchers quite frequently. So, So these are just plausibility theories. Uh, we don't have a definite answer yet, but the restorative theory states that sleep allows our bodies to repair and replenish various cellular components necessary for our functions that become depleted throughout an awake day. So evidence for that comes in that various aspects of muscle repair, tissue growth, release of many of the important hormones for growth occur primarily during sleep. Now, this is really interesting because you'd think that if we're going to, say, just need a rest, it would be just as well for us to simply kind of lie down and, and be still and, and not be running around or doing work or something. But apparently that's not enough. Our body needs something more, uh, that stage of sleep, uh, and not just inactivity. Yeah. Yeah, it's not enough to just be still, as you're saying. We have to really check out. Our brain has to go into a special, uh, you know, kind of state and allow us to get out of the way so that our body can really focus on what it needs to do. Yes. Well, much attention from researchers has focused on the various stages of sleep and brain activity, differentiated by their EEG signatures. Can you briefly describe REM sleep? REM, REM sleep. We've all heard of that, but... What, what does it mean exactly? Well, REM, or rapid eye movement sleep, it's known to be associated with dreaming. It's not, as researchers have found, not considered to be a restful stage of sleep. There's actually some elevated uh, brain activity throughout REM sleep. One source says that our brain metabolism increases by up to 20% uh, during this stage of sleep. So there's there's something going on, but it's it's maybe not the, you know, we think, oh, I was in a vivid dream. I must have been in a deep sleep. Well, there's actually a deeper stage of sleep when you're you're more unconscious and you're not aware of dreaming. But uh, dreams do occur during this REM phase. Um, an interesting part of it that uh, it, it's rather curious that during this stage of our sleep cycle, the body is fully paralyzed, which uh, under normal circumstances anyway. And, you know, you can think that that's probably a good thing because if you're dreaming of uh, running or, you know, flying or jumping off a cliff, it's a good thing you're not really doing that. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, yeah, our, our bodies are as paralyzed as if we were un under some sort of a, an anesthetic. Yeah, that's really interesting. And of the three non-REM sleep levels, 
The deepest is called N3, or slow wave sleep. What is our body doing and not doing during those periods of rest? Well, this is uh, this N3. It's a it's a non-REM uh, stage of sleep, um, and it's the deepest stage. Uh, this is really when most of the bodily and tissue repair processes are happening. Um, the body is is building as necessary bone and muscle. Uh, even the immune system is being strengthened apparently during this. N3 or non-REM stage of sleep. Okay, so that's that's one of the deepest mm -hmm. uh, points in our sleep uh, process. Now, again, I like how you quote from Shakespeare, uh, his 27th sonnet in your articles. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed, the dear repose for limbs with travel tired. Sometimes we fight sleep, though, or disregard our body's need for it. But a lot of the time we're grateful to be hitting the hay. As you reviewed the research on sleep, one thing you confirmed is that sleep is definitely not optional. What are the dangers of depriving ourselves of sleep? Well, I think that all of us have a, a, just a sense uh, from experience that uh, sleep deprivation um, doesn't work to our benefit. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, more careful study of what happens when uh, people are deprived of sleep for a longer period of time shows that it can lead to significant neurological dysfunction, uh, even hallucinations, uh, mood swings, meaning you, know, you're, you don't have as much control over your emotions. If people are not able to get enough sleep on a regular basis, they're at a higher risk of developing various um, morbidities, diseases, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even a higher risk of developing obesity. I mean, that almost seems counterintuitive. You'd think that if you're just lying down sleeping, you're not really expending as much energy as if you're up and active, but uh, the, and you'd think you'd be burning more calories, and so you would not be as overweight, let's say. But the research shows that the opposite often happens, that getting regular sufficient amount of sleep is a preventative uh, for obesity. Yeah. Now, when it comes to figuring out how sleep might have evolved, scientists are basically playing a guessing game. You quote one researcher who even thinks the process of falling asleep came built into organisms, part of the package. We could buy that on a design hypothesis, but that sure doesn't fly from an evolutionary standpoint. What other evolutionary explanations did you come across in your review of the literature? Well, again, the, the one you just mentioned um, really highlights the difficulty that researchers have if they're approaching this from an evolutionary perspective. They, they are, have a great difficulty of trying to understand why we would sleep in the first place. And so this one researcher, you know, in a published article just sort of um, gave up in a sense and punted and inverted the paradigm, suggesting that sleep was our, our native state and that somehow an evolutionary process took place that caused us to enter wakefulness. But honestly, if the coordinated physiological and neurological processes necessary to produce sleep seem daunting from natural processes to have them originate without a designer, then producing wakefulness, which is associated with consciousness, with its attendant qualities of mind, that seems completely beyond the reach of any Darwinian mechanism. So I don't think that, you know, this kind of a clever, um, almost counterintuitive idea that we, we evolved wakefulness and, and we just started off, everything started off asleep. I, I think that that doesn't solve any problems. It actually introduces greater problems from an evolutionary mechanism. Yeah. Well, in the first half of this conversation, you wrote that sleep is irreducibly complex. You also said that our body's sleep-wake cycle exhibits a type of complex engineering design known as the push-pull principle. Can you touch on what that means again here, the, the, the idea of irreducible complexity and the push-pull principle? Yes. Um, again, just um, for example, you know, in studying this, you, you find that Transitions between sleep and wakefulness are not just as simple as uh, flipping a switch. You know, we could think, 
oh, maybe it's just like the room is dark and then the room is light and it's simple. I just turn the switch on or off. But that's not it at all. The sleep-wake states are orchestrated by multiple brain structures, uh, some of which include the hypothalamus, controls the onset of sleep, hippocampus, which is involved in memory regions active during dreaming, the amygdala, uh, the emotion center is active during dreaming, thalamus. It prevents sensory signals from reaching the cortex. We have to have that kind of a disconnect of our our physical being so that we're in a sense in a state of paralysis. And there's other brain structures that are involved. And uh, if you think of the number of structures and then you begin to list the number of neurotransmitters that are active in communicating between these different brain structures to promote sleep or wakefulness, it's it's a monster. I mean, it's a machine, uh, not in a bad way. It's, I just mean to say it's big and it's complicated and it's deep and involved and it's anything but flipping a switch. And so again, to suggest that, oh, all of this just developed over time by undirected changes to our genetic makeup um, that somehow were facilitated by a survival of the fittest uh, selection mechanism. This is absurd. For one, it's way too complicated for random chances to bring it about. And again, the the obvious uh, idea that sleeping is beneficial to survival. Uh, you know, if you're in the wilds and you're in the wilderness and you're an animal and you have to go unconscious for uh, you know hours at a time uh that's not really a uh, a state of being that uh, promotes survival it's it's like saying all right i'll just lie down here you can come and eat me whenever you want to i'm i'm going to be paralyzed and unconscious yeah yeah it's not going to work very well well you write in your articles that sleep should be associated with at least two levels of design and i just want to kind of summarize these for listeners one is seen in the multiple physiological regulatory networks that transition us from wakefulness to sleep and then return us to wakefulness. Uh, talk about the second facet of design real quick, the, the connection between sleep and human flourishing. You've, you've already touched on it, but, mm -hmm. but these are two levels of design. You know, we're talking about deep design here. Uh, how does that figure in? Well, um, you know, these concepts that I'll be mentioning are uh, maybe not as, as cut and dry. They're not really chemistry, but I think that we can all appreciate the importance of them. For example, I, I mentioned in my article, just for fun in a way, imagine a world without sleep. Okay, so nobody sleeps. Animals don't sleep. We don't sleep. Predatory animals, Lions, cheetahs, for example, normally sleep 12 to 13 hours a day, would continually pose a threat. They would never go off duty. Many creatures are not designed to thrive at night. And yet, due to our planet rotating and having darkness about half of the time, that would mean that those animals, half of their existence while darkness prevails, would be in a state of frustration, confusion, boredom, peril. And then if we even think about humans, any parent cherishes the hours that their infants are asleep. Uh, imagine a world where newborn infants never slept. Instead of the usual 16 to 18 hours a day, you know, broken up into naps, um, even toddlers uh, sleeping, you know, more than 12 hours a day. And I think that Parents of newborns would run a risk of uh, succumbing to exhaustion if their children never slept. Again, sleep gives us an extended period of rest for the weary. There's many times when, you know, like in the Shakespeare sonnet, um, yeah, we're weary. Sleep is a, a respite. It um, gives us relief from emotional pain or physical pain. It saves us from periods of, of boredom. And, and think that Almost all of human history took place in an era before uh, electric lights. 
Um, you know, the only light that you had was maybe a campfire at night or the light of stars or, or the moon if it wasn't cloudy. Without sleep, uh, it would be uh, a difficult time. Again, we're not particularly well adapted to thrive in, in darkness. And so sleep allows us a time out. Also, a little, again, more subjective, um, the fact that all people require sleep, even the bad guys, so to speak, uh, kind of sets a limit to the amount of harm that evil people can, can perpetrate. So uh, those are just a few of the, I guess, um, human flourishing related aspects uh, as a benefit of sleep. Yeah, certainly a more chaotic and dangerous world without this in place. Mm -hmm. Thank you for helping us imagine that world, though. It's, it's interesting. And in this fast-paced, always-on way of life that we have now, uh, sleep does indeed help us flourish. What are some tips that you might have after going through the literature and pondering this for a while on making sure we get enough sleep regularly and making sure that sleep is quality? Well, um... You know, I'm not a, a sleep expert or, or a, you know, a doctor. You might ask your doctor about that. But um, uh, I think that one of the key needs that we have for sleep comes from giving our physical being a, a break from our, our nervous systems. I, I say this, that sleep gives respite to the body against the demands of the ever-vigilant mind and brain. And it's like our nervous system is continuously, even in a, an unconscious way, monitoring our surroundings and sorting out signals, some of which we're not perhaps fully consciously aware of, but signals in the environment that uh, are perhaps danger signals and... Um, or, or not. And so there's, there's kind of a, a wear and tear upon our, our being, our physical being, by the watchfulness and the activity of our, our nervous systems. And I, I believe that, you know, promoting sleep, like you ask, you know, what are some tips? Well, uh, the, the Bible, the scriptures suggest that a tranquil mind is one of the best, I guess, conditions for being able to enjoy sleep. You know, for, for me, I find also that uh, the right amount of physical activity is important. Um, researchers will suggest that um, it's important to be outside, to actually get, let our bodies get cues from uh, daylight versus night that, uh, okay, we're you know, it helps to reset the circadian rhythm when you get up in the morning and you, you see the sunlight that is important. You know, if, if we close ourselves in an environment that's artificial, I think that uh, perhaps our regular sleep-wake cycle will be inhibited. I, th I think that in, in general, you know, scientists have found that everything sleeps. If it's alive, it sleeps. And everything that has any sort of a of a nervous system, of a consciousness. And um, so again, I believe that there is, sleep could be described as a trade-off. It's a trade-off for being conscious. Uh, and consciousness actually wears out our bodies is, is kind of my, my thought. It's, it's important for us to not just lie down in repose, but to have our brains uh, disconnected from our bodies for a while so that we can allow our, our physical systems to be restored. Hmm, I like that. So we're taking a break not only from our environment and from our toil and the things going on around us, but also from ourselves. We're taking a break from ourselves uh, in yeah. order to, to face everything the next day. That's, that's a really good insight. Yeah. Well, let me conclude with just a few lines from your second article on sleep. You say this, it's remarkable that we regularly place our consciousness on pause, becoming nearly insensible to external sensory input, and eventually entering a state of total bodily paralysis. Still more amazing is our daily recovery from such a state. 
Our utter dependence upon entering this altered state on a diurnal cycle is also perplexing from an evolutionary perspective. As much as for any aspect of our existence, sleeping and waking point to the reality of a transcendent, intelligent designer. Yeah. Well, very well put. Thank you. Dr. Hedin, thank you for taking the time to speak to us today about this fascinating topic. I uh, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you again. I, I appreciate your uh, willingness to explore this with me. And um, I hope it, that uh, our conversation has provided further evidence for the, uh, the pervasive nature of design, intelligent design in our lives. Yeah, totally. And I was just thinking of uh, that saying that people say, let me sleep on it, you know, uh, and, and that kind of figures in, you know, we, we take in so much uh, stimulation throughout the day, so much information, especially these days, it's important to sleep on it. It's important to, to kind of take your time reflecting and, and uh, siphoning out the things that you will need and things you won't need. Uh, we definitely need to sleep on it, as they say. Well, if you didn't catch the first half of this conversation about the intelligent design of sleep, be sure to go back and tune in. We'll link to Dr. Hedin's sleep articles in the show notes for this episode at ideathefuture.com. And I encourage you to hop on to evolutionnews.org to read more from Dr. Hedin and his colleagues. That's evolutionnews.org. And one more thing, listeners. If you enjoy the content you hear on ID the Future, help us share the podcast with others. Leave a rating and a written review of the podcast on the Apple Podcasts platform. That's one of the places you can actually leave a review these days. Take a second to share a recent episode with a friend. That's easy to do with social media these days. And again, thanks in advance for your help. For ID the Future, I'm Andrew McDermott. Thanks for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.